Eu também estou muito obrigado, agradecido de ficar aqui. É a professora Esteban e a Presídio, a Vantro, por organizar tudo isso. Um, vou ficar uma, uma semana e podemos nos encontrar depois, se vocês querem. Um, estou aqui para conversar com vocês. Agora, quando pediram o título, eu, pensei, eu tinha esquecido que falo português. E é, propus é, Prehistorical Language Migration Rates. Então, está traduzido aqui como Taxas de Propagação de Línguas Prehistóricas. Bom, vindo a esse título, Taxa, o que é isso? Então, meu português não é. Talvez ao nível que é necessário para poder falar, falar, falar das coisas que, das quais eu quero falar, Tasha. A minha esposa é da Rússia, Rússia. Fala muito dos seus amigos, Masha, Maria, Sasha, Alexandre. Caixa, como muito, muito caixa, mas caixa não. Então, vou seguir em é, inglês para não, para não começar com, não sei, russo, é, perdendo. É, Prehistorical language migration rates. É, então, é, que, well, sorry, what is the problem here that we are going to look at? Well, the uh, task or the problem that I'm Uh, getting myself is uh, sort of illustrated here. Uh, we have a, a mother language or proto language here. And languages, they have children like people. So they split up into daughter languages, uh, in this case, two daughter languages. And what I want to know is uh, how far, how quickly did they get from this point to that point, and from that point to this point. So how quickly did they propagate or uh, you know, uh, move in space? In order to know this, I need to know two things. Uh, first, their locations. So if it's uh, modern actual languages, we know where they're spoken. But if they're earlier proto-languages that we have to reconstruct, then we have to have some kind of method to infer where they were spoken. So that's the first problem. Another problem is to uh, infer when they were spoken. So again, if they're not current languages, but some older stages of languages, we need a method to figure out uh, what was the time frame uh, during which they were spoken. Is the sound all right? Yeah? Okay. So um, those are two big problems in historical linguistics, actually. And I think I have some solutions to them. But um, we're going to look at those. So uh, first, to solve these problems, we need some data. And I'm going to explain to you the nature of the data that we're using. Then we need this method for dating uh, languages and for identifying homelands. This is the origin of the languages in space. Uh, a lot of work has to go into checking whether the methods actually work. And that's maybe for you a little bit boring. For me, that's the most interesting part. It's not so much the results, it's actually you know, how to get there. It's the road, not the goal, um, the center of the thing. So uh, we then want to put the winds and the wares together uh, so that we can measure these rates of uh, migration. And I'm going to illustrate what we can do with that kind of data, just looking at one particular language family, the Bantu uh, family. And um, then we're going to look at you know, what are the effects of different factors on the rates of migration. The landscape, um, do people prefer to go in certain directions? Maybe north-south as opposed to east-west or the other way around? And then I'm going to summarize. Um, so what are the uh, what are the data that I'm using? Well, they come from my own database. Uh, I'm not the only one who contributed to this database. It's a big collaborative project. 
and it's been going on for more than 10 years. So what we have is um, a database of uh, word lists and uh, you can ac access that online, you can download the whole thing and some software as well, so there's a download tab here in software. You can visit this and, and check out what, what's there. Uh, if we make just a map of the uh, languages represented, it's going to look like this. Uh, you wouldn't be able to see the difference between this and a map of all the world's languages because it's so comprehensive. Uh, so it has around 70% of the world's languages by now, and we're still uh, adding more. These uh, word lists are transcribed in a simplified system code that we call ASDAP code. Um, and you'll see an example of that in a minute. This is the uh, list of words. Maybe some of you have heard about the American linguist Morris Wardes, who died around uh, the mid-1960s, 1967, I think. Um, in around 1950, he developed this uh, idea of taking a, a list of words and then comparing languages. And the, uh, the core of the, the idea was to have a fixed list of concepts, meanings, that you um, then you found the words for these meanings in different languages, and then you can compare them, and, and you can do some uh, quantitative inferences about age of the proto language and uh, things like that. So this is actually a subset of the list that Morris Wardes um, invented. It's the most stable words, most slowly changing words on that list. Um, so it's very basic to everything that I'm going to be doing uh, um, to uh, compute a distance between two languages. I use the word distance now, but uh, I could say similarity. It's the same thing in, in a way, it's just the opposite, but it's the same basic thing. So sometimes I say difference and meaning similarity, uh, so excuse me for that, but you can get a distance with, from 0 to 1 to a similarity by uh, the subtract, so subtracting that distance from the number 1, right? So it's, anyway, so you compute a distance between two word lists, and I'll show you how to do that. And then we can um, transfer that into a temporal distance between two languages, two or more languages. We can also use this uh, kind of data to infer homelands. So uh, this is this very fundamental linguistic distance, how is this computed? We use something called the Levenstein distance, named after a Soviet uh, computer scientist, Vladimir Levenstein. And it's very simple, it's not like Einstein complicated. It's, um, so you have two words and you check how many um, insertions, deletions, or substitutions that you have to make to get from one word to the other word. So from L to EO, and you know, this is the transcription in ASDP code, so it looks, the words look a little bit funny. But L and EO, you have to change the A to E and the U to O, so that's two operations or two edits. And we uh, divide that by the length of the longest of the two words, so that's a normalization. Uh, that takes into account uh, the word length. So the distance here is one. If we take nós and noi, so this is uh, Portuguese from Portugal, that's why I'm saying nós. I could be Paulista saying nós, but uh, <coughs> so this is meant to be poor, uh, Portuguese of Portugal. So nós and noi, there's one difference, right? So that's one edit out of three letters which is 0.33. For Deutsch and Duel, they just have one uh, letter or say, symbol in common. So the distance is uh, 3 out of 4. And uh, for Folia, it's the same uh, set of symbols. So it's the distance is 0. Um, and we can just have our 40 words. I took a little subset here. We can have our 40 words and make a 
an average, and we have uh, what we call the LDN, the Levenstein distance, normalized. It gets a little bit more complicated because um, <coughs> we make a further normalization. Imagine you have two languages uh, like uh, Finnish and Japanese. These two languages share a lot of sounds. They have relatively simple phoneme inventories, inventories of sounds. And so just by accident, you might take uh, the words for eye or bone or words on this list. And they might be accidentally similar just because the two languages have similar sounds. But uh, Finnish and Japanese are not related, so that's purely accident. Um, but we can, we can take that into account uh, in the following way. So we take the LDN that we just computed and we divide it by the average LDN of words that don't refer to the same concept. So if you have accidental similarities between words that refer to the same concept, concept then that will be punished if you divide it by the similarity between language, uh, words that don't refer to the same concept. Uh, we'll see an example here. So we take the same words, and this time we don't compare eo and eo, but we compare eo and due, can, for you. And uh, norris and eo, due, can, for you, etc. All the pairs of words that don't refer to the same concept, that don't mean the same thing. And then, um, so eo and do and can, for you. Or they, they have uh, an average LDN of 0 0.92 and we can then make an average of the averages and then we divide the original LDN we had here by uh, this average. So this average is going to be close to 1 because the words will tend to be very different, right? But they will be a little bit similar just out of accident. So it's less than 1 here. The smaller this number is, the greater this number is going to be, because we divide. So we punish our distance measure by this normalization, so that in a case like Finnish and Japanese, the uh, difference will be similar to other languages, to a language pair where you know, the sounds are not, don't happen to be similar. So that's it, that's a bit, it's necessary to explain this. Um, now we can go on to start making some interesting things, but really, well, we need more methods. Okay, so how to measure the uh, uh, time distance, how to transfer this linguistic dis distance in, into a temporal distance. For any kind of method to do this, you need um, <coughs> calibration points. Uh, so you need to have some cases where you know what the age of the group is, then you can compare that to what is the linguistic distance and then you can use that as a calibration. If you have many of those, you can uh, begin to um, develop a formula to transfer one kind of distance into the other kind of distance. So we have various uh, cases where we know or think that we know what the uh, historical date of time separation of Group of languages is. So for uh, so Proto Malayo Polynesian, it's a subgroup of the big Austronesian language family. Austronesian languages are spoken all the way from Taiwan uh, to the Isla de Pasco. Isla de Pasco, so the Easter Island, and also in Madagascar. Um, it's a very big language family. Um, uh, some people say it has 10 branches, like this, the family tree has 10 branches. Nine of those are in Taiwan, this little island, and one of them is outside, and that's the whole rest of the language family, that's called uh, Medeo Polynesian. Uh, so the archaeologists can tell us when the Austronesians begin to appear outside of Taiwan. There's a certain kind of poverty and some uh, okay. They had pigs and uh, dogs and uh, certain items of material culture that are characteristic of these Austronesians. So because of that we know that they left Taiwan around um, 
2500 to 2000 before Christ, so four to four and a half uh, thousand years ago. We also have some historical data, uh, in this case about the uh, Slavic languages. So the historical sources tell us about the time when the Slavs began to uh, disperse, uh, the expansion and political anarchy of the Slavs began around 1450 before present. So before BP is before present. Uh, and in a few cases we have some ethnographic uh, evidence. As uh, Professor Stella mentioned, I used to, in my former life, I was a Mayanist and was working with the decipherment of the, the Maya inscriptions. Um, they're very cool because uh, they are big, so you can't move them, they're fixed in space, and they also have dates. Uh, so you have these texts that are fixed in time and space, and uh, the texts themselves uh, have some linguistic variation. So that starts uh, around 400 um, after Christ. You can begin to see the dialects forming and uh, so we can date this particular language group called Jordan to that time, 1600 before present. Okay, we, in a paper we published uh, about this, we assembled uh, 52 calibration points. Uh, that was very hard work, maybe it's the most, the biggest contribution of that paper. It was very hard to find all these cases, and find cases that you can actually trust. Um, but once we had done that, we could um, do this exercise that I mentioned before. We can take the linguistic distances. These are here. Actually, there are similarities. As I mentioned, I, I keep confusing these two. But similarity and distances is pretty much the same thing. Uh, so you see uh, these groups that uh, have a shallow time depth, so they, um, like the Slavs. So in recent time, that you get the diversification of the Slavic languages. So they will have small distances or big similarities, so closer to 100. And uh, the further uh, back in time you go, the more different the language is becoming. Okay, so you can make a sort of standard correlation of these things uh, and get this line. There's a reason why this is a logarithmic scale. And I'll just give you an intuition. So if you have a certain amount of changes for 100 years, then you go uh, 100 years later, you'll have maybe the same amount of changes, but that now applies to uh, the changes that you already had. Right? So uh, these changes are cumulative, and that's why uh, you need an algorithm curve. I won't say more about that. If it doesn't help you, forget it. Um, Main point here is you have a straight line, and uh, that has two uh, parameters. It has a slope, and it has this point where it hits the axis here. So at time zero, the similarity is actually not 100%, it's a little bit less. And that uh, reflects something in reality. When we speak to each other, we have differences in the way we speak. Every language has dialects, and the dialects have idiolects. Uh, so there's some variation within any language, and that's why it, this line is not hitting at 100% similarity. Okay, so from uh, this uh, uh, graph, we can derive a formula looking like this. Um, and it's basically just a linear formula. Uh, there's a, uh, this two here, this number, why do we have that? Well, that's, I'll just give you the intuition is that when you want to measure the time distance between A and B, so two languages, you have to go through the, the mother language, right? That's why you have the two in this place. Okay, this is all I'm going to say about this. Just trust me, we have the formula here that, where, that we can meaningfully use to transfer linguistic distance into a temporal distance. Um, that gives us a huge amount of data, actually, that we can start to play with. Uh, so because of the size of this um, database, we can have more than 4,000 uh, 
dates for different language groups, families and subgroups, and subgroups of subgroups. That was the first task. Um, the next task is to identify these homelands. Um, so I was thinking a lot, a lot about these things back around 10 years ago, and then I got the idea that, well, we could look at what, what they've been doing in biology, especially. The idea has also been around in, in linguistics, but it was never really implemented. So this idea is that you find the area where there's a, uh, the diversity is greatest within a language family, that's probably where the homeland was. Well, this Vardilov is uh, very Russian, very tragic, uh, very f an interesting character. Uh, he was killed by Stalin, like all good scientists uh, at that time. But before that, he, were, he collected seeds from all over the world because he wanted to find out where the important crops uh, were first Know, um, developed. So imagine if you um, have something like corn. Corn is very important in South America. Um, if you want to find out where people first started uh, planting that and you know, cultivating corn, you want to look for the place with, where there's a lot of diversity of species of corn. That's what what Babilo was was doing. Uh, and. Um, well, today this method is a little bit um, outdated because now we have genetics, so we have better methods. But for linguistics, we don't have similar, we don't have uh, uh, genetics methods that we can apply. But we can apply something similar to his method. Um, but we have to somehow implement that quantitatively um, because we are dealing with um, statements like. This area is more diverse than this area, so this area is probably the homeland. But we, every time we have quantitative statements like that, we need numbers, right? We need to implement this idea. So what I um, what I did was um, I was thinking, well, say you have a set of languages. Say think about Austronesian, uh, this huge language family. As I mentioned before. Most of the lineages start uh, you know, are in Taiwan, uh, and there's this one lineage that left Taiwan and is in the rest of the uh, half of the world, basically. Um, so that means that on, on the island of Taiwan, you will have very small geographical distances between the languages, but these languages will be very different. Out in the Pacific, um, you will have these um, uh, you know, languages that are very far apart, spoken on various islands, and they're going to be quite similar, but very far apart. So what if we look at each language, and uh, the thinking is that um, when you have a language family with various languages, probably one of them is closer to the homeland than some, uh, some other language. So the location of the current languages can probably be used to say something about the origin of these languages. So, um, so you take each language and then you look at the geographical distance to all the other languages on average. If that's very small, uh, then that's more likely that you are sort of sitting in the homeland. But you want to take the linguistic distance into account also. If that, the linguistic distance is very high, then that's even better. So if you take the linguistic distance and divide that by geographical distance, then you get a number, a kind of diversity index, you could call it. And you can use that uh, to um, identify the language which is most likely to be located in the homeland. I'm going to go through an example. Uh, but first, a couple of nice pictures. So these uh, dots are Tupian languages very well-known uh, Brazilian language family, if nothing else you know Tupi or not Tupi. Um, so this is Tupi, and um, the colors here are like topographical colors. Uh, so uh, blue is like the ocean, 
it's very low, it's low indices, and then green is colored, so that's more like a little bit higher indices, and these uh, grayish uh, colors represent the highest indices. So these colors are practical because you can see uh, <coughs> that probably the homeland is around here, right? This is where you have the highest indices, and then they become lower as you move in different directions from there. So it looks like uh, the two peaks that started out here and then uh, dispersed. And uh, this is actually what the experts would also say, um, but that's actually based on the Keynesian kind of thinking that, okay, this is where you have most of the lineages. Um, so uh, the fact that this hypothesis gets some support from the experts doesn't really mean much because the experts are thinking along the same lines but they didn't quantify that kind of thinking which is what I did. Okay, here's another example just for fun. You could take dialects of North American Indians and do the exact same thing and you would find that the homeland is in Boston. Okay, this is pretty much where they arrived uh, when they set out from where I come from, from Leiden. <laughs> um, okay, and you see Los Angeles uh, is a small red dot, meaning that's a very poor candidate for being the homeland. Um, today that's the most influential, influential dialect, but that's another story. Um, so it seems to be working. Um, but we'll get to some more evaluation of this method uh, in uh, a bit. First, let me go back and explain again, but in, with some actual numbers, how, how to compute this. So here's a third example. It's the Eskimo Aleut uh, language family. So it consists of two major branches, the Aleut languages out here, and the rest. Uh, and here's Greenlandic. Um, so we have ten languages or dialects. How to how to know where they came from? That's the you know, question here. You have a huge area and you want to know where they came from. So what you first do is make a linguistic distance matrix. You compute this LD and G, this normalized Levenstein distance, divided for all these. So um, here's Aleut. And here's the linguistic distance to Central Yupik and all the other ones. So it's a symmetrical matrix, Aleut and Aleut, of course, zero distance. And then you make a geographical uh, distance matrix. And that looks like this. So the distance between Aleut here and Central Yupik is 730 kilometers. And this is using the distance, uh, the great circle distance, or shortest path on the uh, globe, so the direct distance between two points on the globe, the shortest distance. Okay, and given these two, we can begin to uh, compute our diversity indices. So this is just taking one language, the again, valued. So we have uh, all the linguistic distances here in the first row and all the uh, Geographical distances in, uh, in the second row, and we just divide one by the other, we get these numbers, and then we take the average. So that's 0 0.0629, uh, 0 and that would be the diversity index of values. And we then do that for each language, and then we can rank order them. Uh, so it turns out that Central Yupik has the highest diversity index and then um, the lowest ones are down here. Note East and West Greenlandic all the way out to the east and also Inuktitut is, is quite far out to the east. So uh, as it turns out, we can propose that uh, Eskimo Aleut started out in this area uh, this is the exact language that we identified as the homeland, but you see it's very close to this other one, which is Aleut. Uh, <coughs> and out here we have the lowest indices. This is the very lowest, and these are the next ones. So this is not the homeland, this is where they arrived in more recent times. And that's actually all confirmed by uh, archaeological evidence. 
So it's nice. The method seems to be working. It's a very simple one, and medically it gives good results, apparently. Uh, but it's very rare that we actually have some good information about uh, the origins of language families. As I said, for Austronesian, we can say something for this family, we know something. But even for Tupi, for instance, we think we know, but we actually don't really know where they came from. And that goes for 95% of all cases. So how to actually check whether this works? Um, this is just... Uh, saying that we have a lot of data points now for this. Um, and this is also another parenthesis saying that in two days I can demonstrate to you how to do this yourself. Uh, I have some software now that allows you to infer uh, dates and homelands. Homeland. Okay, but now coming to the bot. Uh, does this really work? Um, how can we know that? Uh, what we can do is to uh, simulate uh, things. So we can take a computer, we can create data similar to uh, what we were looking at, but our own data, where we know what the origin is. And we create a language family that sort of develops, diversifies into different languages, and we have some words that we also create ourselves and they change. Then we can apply the exact same method and see, you know, does it work or doesn't work, and why might it, why does it fail in certain uh, cases? The way I do this is um, I use geographical data points from a database called geonames.org, which basically has all populated places on Earth. It's uh, close to three million. Um, then I make the languages develop and they walk around, uh, you know, they migrate, but restricted to these points that are populated state. And uh, now I can uh, apply my method and see if it works. So let's go through the details, but quickly. Uh, for simulating a language family, well, you need some words. In this case, I'm taking 40 because that's what I'm using uh, with real data. Then I uh, create a, a huge family, uh, which is, and, and uh, the real fam the family that's going to be simulated is going to be a subset of that language family. Uh, you will see in a minute how that works. I need a number of time steps, some probabilities of teens of the words and the sounds in the words, and probabilities that a language is split up into two at certain points or that they die out. Um, so uh, simulating things is, is not so easy and it should be done very carefully. Uh, you produce data, um, so it's a bit like actually working with real data and you should be very careful about choosing these parameters. Um, and so this is not something that uh, you can do really quickly. Uh, it takes some time to develop and some time to evaluate the simulations that you're going to use for your evaluation of your methods. It's uh, complicated. Anyway, uh, so here's an example of how I would create uh, a list of words and how that would be, um, uh, that list would change over time. So this would be a proto-language. It's the mother language, the first language in the lineage, and it has a set of randomly created words. And uh, here's uh, what happens five time steps later. So time steps, that's an abstract, you know, those are abstract units, you can't say it corresponds to 100 years or 1,000. Uh, it's just time steps. You see uh, uh, here word number 21, which is uh, ha, uh, ha, here that changes to ga, right? So there's some sound changes going on. We also have some lexical changes in orange. Uh, so uh, this word uh, used to be boya, and all of a sudden it becomes yogurts. Okay. So I simulate some changes and lexical changes, and uh, as a, a large number of time steps, all the words are going to have undergone some phonological or lexical change. 
So I do this, and then now I can compare those work lists using the Levenstein distance uh, from before. Okay, but I also need um, a family tree. So how do I do that? As I mentioned before, I use a big uh, underlying. Uh, this is a binary branching symmetrical tree. Uh, the, we don't have these trees in reality. No language family looks like that. But I can use that and then um, in the end get something that's more re realistic. Uh, so normally I would have a much bigger tree. This is just a small one for uh, illustration. So here's one branch. And I look at what uh, the, you know it has. In it takes time to get from here to here, and a certain number of time steps. At each step, there's a certain probability that this language is going to give birth to another language. That happens at this particular point, and so you get this new language. Uh, it, could, it could happen that this language dies out, and you could have this language dying out as well, then the whole family would be gone. That happens sometimes when I simulate families, I end up with nothing, because the whole family dies out. And that's like where it's... Uh, so I, I do this, and I end up with um, maybe something like this. So you see a much, more, a much smaller tree, but which is a subset of the bigger tree, and it's something that looks more realistic. Um, so you could uh, encode the tree in a kind of table like this. This is the number of time steps. These numbers have different languages. So now you have a family tree, right? And you have, you have the word list for each of these languages. And you can begin to compare the word list. You can say the word list for language 5 and 1, compute the Lernstein distance, use some, um, um, some way of turning that into a kind of time depth. So that's how I uh, simulate language families. I also need to simulate people moving on, uh, on Earth. And uh, for that, uh, as I mentioned, I use the, um, this database of populated places. So I start out at a certain place, uh, then I draw a little square around that and see are there some other places that I can move to. Um, and I have a parameter called CH um, for choices. Um, so this is the number of choices I want to have in my simulations for the next step. So you will see how that works here. This is just a list of all the populated, uh, how many there are for different areas in the database. And here's an example of uh, plotting all these populated places on a map. I come from this country, so I know that uh, very well, and anyone knowing the, sort of the geography will immediately see that uh, there's enough populated places, enough dots, that you get the entire geography of the country. Uh, you don't get mountains and, and so on, you get uh, the, the contours here. And you, this is water. This is not water, it's just a thinly populated area. Let's zoom in on one particular area and let's, um, you know, play the migrations. Uh, so that's the area. This is water, actually. These are some places. So we choose a starting point randomly. We make a little square. Count how many populated places are there within this square, and that's just one. So we want to make it bigger. Um, and we uh, make it bigger and bigger until we have enough dots to accommodate whatever we chose as our CH parameter. Which was 30, so now we have more than 30, and we can go to the next step. Uh, we can take the, the next step. And then we redo the whole uh, procedure. Ju -ju. That's how people move around in space. It's a sort of what they call a random walk, but it's not quite random. So it's a sort of restricted random walk. Um, okay, good. Uh, the nice thing about this is that um, I get geography sort of for free. 
instead of using some heavy uh, EIS files with a lot of information, I just have uh, a table of coordinates with the populated places. So that's very easy to work with. It doesn't take a lot of computer power. I can use my laptop to do this. And then you see that it, it, it will take geography into account to a certain extent. So here in, uh, is a simulation that takes place in Kyrgyzstan. And here's where they start out. Uh, the uh, red dots are various stations on the way. I didn't draw lines between them, but that you can sort of imagine that they walk around here. At a certain point, they cross over to this area. And this is where, they, where the uh, black dot is, is where they end up. So you see, they never uh, settle you know, on the mountain ridge or in some appropriate place. This is the uh, Egypt, and uh, this is desert, and you see all the stations of the migration uh, is you know, not in the desert, but in this oasis or whatever it is. So you, you take it to geography into account um, in a simple way. Um, so now we can uh, apply that and uh, check if our method works. So here's a case where um, we start out uh, at the, uh, this uh, green square and we uh, simulate these uh, languages. Um, uh, they end up here where the red dots are. Those are the final stations at time, step, whatever, 100 or whatever we chose. And the white dots are the stations in between. Uh, so in the end, what we have are these red dots, and that's what we would have in reality, just like the map of Eskimo earlier that I showed you before, where we had 10 dots and tried to figure out where is the homeland. In this case, we know where the homeland uh, was, and we actually have all the intermediate stations. Um, we have these word lists that we simulated, and then we uh, apply the same method, and it turns out that the inferred homeland is here which is actually pretty close to the uh, true homeland. So in this case, the method works very well. <coughs> Magic. Uh, here's another case where it works more or less. We have all the languages in the dot, the red dots. The true homeland is, is here, and the inferred homeland is sufficiently close that we can say this is reasonable. Um, and another case where it works very well, but in some cases it doesn't work so well. So here's the true homeland. This is somewhere in you know, the uh, United Arab Emirates. Apparently there was an initial jump from this area to this area across the water. And uh, that's why all the lineages end up in this place to the north and uh, never to the south where they started out. So any method will have problems in this case to infer from these red dots that they actually started out here. Um, so in certain cases where the landscape is of a certain kind or where there were some initial jumps, the method will have problems. Um, there's another case uh, where they start out here and somehow accumulate in this area to the west and the method sort of fails. Um, but uh, if we simulate many cases, we can at least check, we can, you know, we can start out checking uh, on average, does it work better than some baseline? Um, so uh, one baseline might be, take a random matrix and say, this is where the homeland is. Um, we could call it the random method. Another one might be, uh, take, the language, take the area in the center of the, language family and say this is where they came from. And a third method might be this one that I just presented, the diversity method. So here are some numbers. How well does, does it work in comparison to taking a random language or taking the sensor? These are some numbers representing the amount of error, some abstract numbers. So a smaller number is better. And you see the diversity method works better than taking a random language. 
And so it's much better than setting the center of the language family area. So think of the Eskimo earlier case before, if we had taken the center of that, of course that wouldn't work very well. Might actually, in that case, work better to take a random language. This is what we find also in the simulations that, uh, um, well, the method works better than these baselines. That's good. Uh, still, there are these annoying cases where it just fails completely because of the landscape, because of initial migrations. And how can we identify those? Those are outliers. If you plot the areas, you will get some big cases with a few cases with very big areas like this, but most cases will be more or less okay. So there are these outliers and how to identify them. And um, uh, I have a colleague, Tarek Arlama, uh, who's working on this, so I gave him thousands of simulations, little pictures that we can then where we can then uh, try and train a neural network to identify uh, the, you know, the bad cases, these outliers. That's something we're working on at the moment. So for the moment, uh, let's just assume that the method works. Now we know that it doesn't always work, and that it never works you know, uh, very 100% exactly, but let's uh, more or less trust the method and uh, now we can try it and put the whens and wheres together. As I mentioned before, we now we have the dates, we have the homelands and we can try and begin to infer migration rates. So we're getting to the empirical stuff here that to you might be a bit more interesting than all these methodological issues. Let's go to the bandsuits. So those are famous because it's the uh, biggest it's actually a subgroup, it's not a language family, it's a language family subgroup. But it's the biggest group of languages in Africa, and one of the biggest in the world. So they cover uh, all of sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, applying uh, the homeland method, we can uh, uh, identify all the intermediate homelands of the language groups. So the dark dots are the oldest homelands, and the white ones are the youngest. So the darkest ones are up north, and then uh, you can sort of have a picture here of how they uh, spread out towards the south. Um, and that fits what, what the experts would say. Um, there's some discussion about whether they first went uh, towards the east and then towards the south, or, when, or whether it was the other way around. So there's these two basic scenarios that people discuss. But this more or less fits uh, what we think we know about Bensu. We can also plot these individual migration events from a mother language to a daughter language. Uh, and then you get a kind of messy picture like this. Um, it's been said that uh, there was never a single Bantu migration, even if one calls it expansion. Uh, that seems pretty obvious, but people have tended to think about the Bantu expansion as like one big event. Of course, it's a number of small events taking place over a huge area and a huge time period. That's the way we should think about it, and you know, this illustrates that very well, so it's really messy, right? Um, Still, we would like to be able to make some generalizations, if we can. And um, here's how we might do that. So again, we have a mother language and some daughter languages, and we can uh, measure the speed of migration. Uh, so we have location for the mother and the daughter. Actually, this daughter didn't move. Uh, and that took them a, hundred, uh, a certain number of years. Um, here the daughter moves from one location to another location and again uh, some time passes. So we can uh, add up these numbers and get uh, a migration rate um, and that's around one kilometer per year in this little illustrative case. So uh, now we can look at the, these migration rates over uh, space. So you should be reading this from the right to the left, like this. 
this is going north to south. These are the latitudes. So uh, plus five latitude is above um, what do you call it the um, uh, equator. Equator, right? Uh, and then this is equator, and this is further south. Uh, as you go south, you see the migration rates, the speed increases. So they move slowly at the beginning, and then they move more and faster and faster. But this is one generalization that you could make even in this you know, messy picture of all these little events. But there is some regularity here in this, uh, as this is concerned. We can also look at uh, time and see you know, at different time periods, are there different rates? Um, again, we go from right to left here. So this is the oldest period, about 5,000 years ago. Around uh, between uh, around 4,500 years ago, there seems to be a peak uh, in the speed of migration, and another one around 3,000 years ago. So this might call the first peak might correspond to the initial migration out of the homeland somewhere to the northwest, and um, then there's another peak that I don't know how to interpret at the moment. But then, you know, as linguists, we can then feed this kind of data to the archaeologists and maybe geneticists, and then they would be the ones to give us the explanations. So you see, that's, uh, what happens whenever you use quantitative methods is that you get some numbers, you can you know, produce some graphs, do some statistics, and that allows you to talk to other disciplines, because they can take these numbers and do something with them. We were, you know, working qualitatively. We might say, okay, they probably came from the northwest. Do something with that. And that's that's hard, you know. But once you have numbers, then you can begin to make correlations and uh, do things and talk to other disciplines. Okay, that was just an illustrative case. Uh, now let's go to the whole world. Let uh, the world be our playground. Um, and uh, apply the same sort of thinking. So there's different world areas, and it's practical to divide them into Papua or the Aust Australia, uh, you know, Eurasia, Africa. And, but I'll take two of them here first. So uh, in the Pacific area, there's uh, the Austronesian languages that I talked about before. It's one big family. And there are the Papua languages, which are actually dozens of language families. We just call them Papua, and that means non Austronesian. They are spoken mainly on uh, Papua New Guinea. So it's one island, basically. And what are the migration rates uh, for that? So uh, the blue ones here are the Papua guys. And you see that's a very small number. <coughs> Uh, kilometers per year, so it's you know, around 0 0.1 or 2 or 3, and um, that doesn't change. So this is the most recent uh, millennium, then we go further back in time to 5,000 before present. So the rate of migration increases a little bit, but it's very, <coughs> very small. Um, for Australia, there's a peak here at a certain point, but it's also in general very small. It's uh, uh, usually less than one kilometer per year. The initial peak here might be might correspond to uh, the time when they left uh, the northern part of Australia. So in Australia, we have um, various language families, and then there's one big one that uh, spreads to the whole continent, and the rest stay out in the north. The big one is called Parmanyungan, Parmanyungan languages. And for some weird reason that nobody understands, they decided to spread to the whole of Australia at some point in time, which actually corresponds pretty well to this. We don't know exactly when that was, but this picture suggests that it was, uh, what, uh, like 5,000 years ago. Um, yeah, we don't know why. They, usually people spread because of agriculture. Uh, but in this case, you don't have agriculture in Australia. So people have speculated that maybe they invented some kind of um, 
ritual structure or some kind of social way of organizing people that just sort of uh, made them very successful and uh, allowed them to spread all over this uh, place. Okay, uh, other world areas. Um, in general, what we see is a slow start with uh, low migration rates, around one kilometer per year or something like that. And then four different areas, um, an increase. So it's only in the Australia and the Papua region where we don't really find much going on. The rest of the world, uh, you see things speaking up at different periods. So in Eurasia, around 4,000 years ago, you see this boom. In uh, South America, and that was surprising to me actually, uh, all this is quite new. It's based on the most recent version of the database, so I've only seen these pictures the, you know, in the last few days when I was producing them. Um, so what to make of this? Uh, there was a boom probably in agriculture around 3,000 years ago that uh, allowed these families to expand and that increased the migration rate. And that came earlier uh, in, in South America than, uh, say, in the Austin-Eastern region and in North America, but later than in Eurasia. Um, okay, so I'm not sure about all details of this picture. It might change somewhat if we increase the database, or so I have to work more on, on, on all of this. But definitely, it's certain that for all these various areas, there's an increase in, in the migration rate at some thousand years ago. And um, then in most recent times, what you see here is uh, that uh, things you know, don't stop. It's not like people stop migrating, it's just that the migration rate stays more or less the same. It's still very high, so this doesn't mean too much. Okay, uh, for the whole world, if we average all these things together, we will get a picture like this. Uh, indicating that like, for thousands of years the rate of migration was lower than one and then it increased. But that's a world average, so maybe it's not so telling. Still, it's sort of nice uh, to look at. Um, and you see again a kind of a plateau uh, in the most recent millennium. Um, that's when uh, certain European languages try to begin to expand rapidly, but it's only very few languages. The rest of them more or cease to expand probably, or uh, don't do it so rapidly. So people sometimes complain when I talk about these things that why don't you use uh, realistic distances? You always measure the distance from A to B as the shortest distance of, uh, on the, uh, you know, the sphere of the Earth, the so-called distance as the crow flies in English. And you don't have a good Portuguese term for that, but the shortest path. Not because people don't move that way, they walk, you know, they uh, walk around, and if there's a lake, they're not going to swim through, they're going to walk around it, right? Um, so in order to see what might happen if we use something more realistic, I, I was forced to develop a measure of walking distance. That gets me into competing with Google. You know? um, and actually, I think I won because I can measure distances that Google Maps can't measure because it's restricted to areas where you have roads or ferries. Um, so what I'm doing is again using tunames.org and I connect all these dots in what is called uh, uh, the Lone, uh network and I measure the shortest distance uh, through that network using a certain algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm after a Dutch uh, computer scientist. So the computational people will know these concepts, you don't really need to know the details. Um, but that's just, this is how I do it. So an illustration might be something like this. Uh, if we go back to that area that I showed before, we uh, could walk from A to B using the straight uh, 
the distance as the crow flies or the straight distance you would need to cross water. And of course, you wouldn't do that in reality. You would walk a bit like this. And that would be captured by this other more realistic uh, distance measure. So what happens if we apply that uh, and then look at uh, migration rates in the entire world? Uh, does it make a difference? Well, for this whole segment of the time uh, in prehistory, it really doesn't make a difference. Uh, so the walking distance that I just illustrated, uh, how, how you compute, is the blue line. And up to this point, um, it really doesn't make a difference. Uh, it's only in more recent times that, when, that people take very big jumps uh, that involve entire oceans. Um, that's when the, the, this other method makes a significant difference. So that's nice to know. And you know, it's also nice to have some, this byproduct of the whole research that I can now offer you a walking distance if you need to know if you want to walk from here to Los Angeles. Well, Google Maps can't help you because you need to cross the Darien Gap uh, in Panama and there's no roads and so Right. You can't, you can't tell you how far that is. I can tell you that. Okay. We might also ask, um, so now we looked at different time periods, different world areas. Uh, now, are there effects of the landscape on the movement? Um, so the landscape, so we need some kind of way of characterizing the landscape and we can use what is called biomes and you'll see a whole list of what they are. So they can be classified into, so you can classify the landscape into uh, well, a small number of so-called biomes, which is uh, different kinds of landscape. And here's what a biome map of Mexico would look like. And we can zoom into this area. And it so happens you've seen, you've seen this before. This is what I started out with at the, in the very first slide. You have this mother language, you have two daughter languages, um, and as I said, I wanted to know how, how quickly do you get from this point to these points. Um, now I can now I, now I know that. Now additionally, I want to know does it make a difference uh, that these guys are walking in the green area and these guys are walking in the yellow area, which is a different kind of landscape. So do these biomes have an effect on uh, the uh, migration rate? Okay, if you look uh, you know, carefully, you'll see here that uh, these guys that walk from this point to this point, the Otomis, uh, they mostly stay within this green region, but then they will walk into the yellow region also a little bit. And that will also be the case um, that. Okay. Um, it will often be the case when you map these things that uh, people pass through different kinds of biomes, which complicates a little bit things when we want to measure uh, what is the effect of the biomes if you walk through different uh, kinds. Okay, so um, in this list we, uh, we restrict ourselves to cases where people stay in within just one biome. Um, that would be more or less like this. They all they, they stay within this yellow area, 100 percent. Then we can look at the uh, uh, speed migration rate, Tasha, Migration, so and so many kilometers per year uh, within different kinds of landscapes. So we have rock and ice and lakes and mangroves and. Um, the most important here are the ones where we see a lot of variation. And that's uh, deserts and uh, good luck with the translation, steric shrublands. She can handle it. I couldn't. Separate grasslands, savannas, and shrublands, so something like compass, you know. Um, and uh, uh, in a minute we'll see a third one, which is interesting. Because uh, actually, 
we don't get very many cases here, n equals 1 means we have only one case. That's not very interesting. So we need to uh, relax our criterion a little bit here to say that uh, it's okay if they pass through another biome as long as they uh, stay within one particular biome for 90% of the, of the uh, you know, walk. Um, so that gives us more cases. Now we have an extra um, interesting case that of oceans. We couldn't look at those cases before because if you go from this island to this island, you start out on land, which is one kind of biome, you pass through the water, which is a different kind. Uh, so you, you know, when you move across the ocean, you will always move uh, between at least two biomes. Okay, now we have a number of cases here. You can see that's another uh, type of landscape that allows for a greater uh, variation in the speed of migration. So, uh, in all sorts of landscapes, you know, from jungle to uh, tundra, whatever, it's the same sort of rate of migration. It doesn't have an effect, but for these three cases, it, it does. So deserts, uh, these grasslands and oceans. Um, why is that the case? It's because in a desert you can speed up, you can walk faster. Uh, probably not. I mean, it's not easy to walk in a desert, right? Uh, uh, on the ocean, you can yeah, you can sail quickly. Um, I think it's more like um, you're kind of forced to move on. In the ocean, you're not gonna, you know, you, you need to get from one island to the other, next island. In the, uh, it's the same in a desert, the, except the islands are oases, uh, so you need to cross more or less quickly. You can settle, probably for these grass, uh, you know, savannas, uh, grasslands, it's uh, similar. So it's not that a certain landscape speeds you up because it's easy to move, it just forces you to move around more. Um, another topic is uh, what does your, uh, your way, your, you know, if you're a food producer, uh, an agriculturalist, does that change your speed of migration? So now we compare agriculturalists and hunter-gatherers in different time periods. So the red guys are the agriculturalists, and the green ones are the hunter-gatherers. And long they together different kinds of hunter-gatherers. Some, a lot of them rely for a little bit on agriculture, on Sago, maybe in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, or they might rely on fishing a little bit. And so I dumped these uh, together in just two categories. And I get this quite clear picture that um, at all periods, uh, during all periods of time, the agriculturalists walk faster, so they migrate uh, quicker. But this is not surprising, actually. If you uh, ask somebody on the street, you know, who moves around more agriculturalists or hunter gatherers, that person might say, okay, of course, the hunter gatherers, because they're always looking for food, you know, chasing down animals or whatever. Um, and the agriculturalist, the farmer, has to stay and, you know, take care of his field. But over time, the agriculturalist will move more, actually, because they need new land all the time. Um, the population expands, and so they need to uh, you know, cultivate new areas. Anthropological studies show that uh, when you start becoming an agriculturalist, a farmer, in the beginning it's actually not very good for you. There's a lot of diseases that start, population is not growing uh, immediately, but then later on you get a positive effect. And that's very strong, and that makes uh, these language families expand so greatly, and that accounts for this. What you see here. The hunter-gatherer will stay within a certain territory, maybe you only need that much land with that many animals and so on to uh, chase down, you're not going to uh, leave that area. 
Finally, I'm getting closer to the end so that you can begin to relax. Um, it's been claimed uh, famously by Garrett Diamond in his book Guns, Germs and Steel that, uh, and in other places that uh, farmers prefer to move in uh, longitudinal directions. So you can contrast longitudinal would be like this on the map and uh, latitudinal would be like this. But when I say longitudinal and latitudinal, I tend to get confused in my, in my head. So let's just say east, west, and north, south. Although when I say north, south, I might mean south, north. It's just like this way, right? Okay. Um, so um, is that true? How we can check this? Uh, making a plot like this. So again, we look at different time periods. And we have these two categories. And we look at the ratio of uh, east-west to north-south movements. Um, so I, I look at one particular movement and I look at you know, the direction they go from here to here. So that would be east-west, west-east. If they moved like this, it would be north-south, south-north. Um, so there's a cutoff point between the two, which is like 45 degrees. And uh, I put all events where they move, you know, in this cone, in the category of east-west, uh, west-east. And, and all the categories in this cone would be like north-south. So there's a simplification I could do differently. Uh, but it, it works. It gives us the pizza that we sort of expected, which is kind of nice uh, that the ratio is also always about one, except in one case in the beginning, for the agriculturalist, and it sort of fluctuates for the hunter gatherers. So it fluctuates around a ratio of uh, one, meaning they could go north south, they could go east west. It's random, but it's not random for the uh, agriculturalist. They tend to move in this direction a little bit more than this direction. So that confirms what uh, Derek Diamond proposed, but it does it quantitatively actually using some data uh, that we can put numbers on. So um, to uh, get to the end, let me just make some final observations. One would be that, and I actually I didn't say that before, but I, now I have a last chance to say that, that when we speak of language migrations, of course, that's not always exactly the same as talking about the movement of people. Because uh, language can spread uh, without people moving, so I can marry somebody who then takes over my language, and my kids will then speak my language, maybe they move. But uh, this person that I marry might not actually be moving. Um, so you can have language shift, and in that way, uh, languages can spread without people actually spreading much. But generally, uh, language movement will also imply movement of speakers. We just need to take that, you know, remember that. Um, I think most movement of people is due to slow diffusion rather than migration. So we can't ignore cases where people have, you know, gone very far to new areas. But I think that's sort of the exception. Um, and we see these slow rates for a large part of uh, world history. You saw uh, that people migrate like one kilometer per year or less, or even or much less. And in certain areas of the world, it was like around 0 0.1, like 100 meters per year. Right? <clears throat> uh, also, we shouldn't think that like if you live in a rainforest, that that is a problem in terms of migrating. And you run into a tree, boom, and you can't get any further. And some people actually think along those lines. I'm, I'm, paired, I'm making a parody a little bit of this. But people have talked about the Bantu case uh, uh, in those terms, so people have been thinking about, you know, why didn't the dancers leave immediately? Well, they were caught up in this rainforest and then there was this corridor that opened and then they started spreading south. 
at a time when this corridor opened. But it seems a bit weird to think about things like, like that. It's not like you can't move in a rainforest. Of course you can move, you just walk in, but you know, you take care of not walking into a tree, you're, you're fine. So it's not uh, so much impediment, impediments to movement that are important, but it's more like impediments to settling. So if you can't settle because it's, you are in the middle of the ocean or some desert, that, that makes a difference. And that will speed up your rate of migration if you are in an you know, ocean or desert. Um, you might also think about the world, you know, the way the world was populated in terms of, uh, in the following way, if you have a, an area, a virgin area where nobody went, maybe you can go there and you can move very quickly because there's nobody else to stop you. Uh, so people are thinking of, have been thinking about the migration into the Americas as sort of uh, taking the Pan American Airlines and boom, getting from the Bering Strait to Tierra del Fuego in, in no time. But it did seem to occur relatively quickly, but um, that, that couldn't be how it, how it happened. Of course, people would uh, have, they need time to um, accommodate to the environment and learn how to survive. And uh, once you learn how to survive in a given area, you don't want to move out of that. So it's not like because you enter into an area that's virgin that you then move fast and necessarily. I don't think so. Uh, but then in some extreme cases, the area the, might be so small that you can't move much. But that really only happens in New Guinea. Uh, it's a small island, there's lots of people and lots of languages, as I mentioned. And uh, that might be a sort of unique case where you're kind of locked up. Um, so as we saw, agriculturists tend to spread more quickly along the east-west axis uh, for, you know, it was an eight out of nine time periods. Uh, and it doesn't make a difference for the hunter-gatherers. So that was one observation. And I'll end here with a sort of philosophical remark, since I've been thinking about migrations, uh, I wouldn't want to call the migration more like diffusion of people for so long, I sort of come to the idea that I think what we, people actually don't really want to do this. I think most people want to stay where they are. When they move, it's because they're forced to. And even some of these explorers who went very far were actually forced to, to, to you know, go to new lands. So we don't really want to move, but we sometimes have to. And eventually that uh, was what uh, drove the people of the entire planet. Um, that's it. So uh, a few references and some resources that you might want to check out. So I'll leave that slide here. And as I say, thank you for your attention. And uh, now you can throw some questions at me, and you're welcome to do it in Portuguese. I'll try my best to understand what you say. Thank you.